Good afternoon, my name is Ken Gagney, and I'm honored to be here as a member of the Apple II community. Val invited anyone who thought they might have a topic of interest to App Party to present. Thank you very much, Val. I was at App Party two years ago. I'm sorry to have missed you last year. I'm thrilled to be back. But I am here to talk to you about the Apple II, where it is today, and I'm going to start with a little bit of history. Sorry if this is review for some of you, but about 36 years ago or so, these two Steves had an idea. They, uh, the bearded one, put together this machine, and he wanted to sell it. And he worked at HP, Hewlett Packard. His buddy, the other Steve, worked at Atari, so they each went to their employer and said, hey, we got this thing we came up with. We're wondering if you want to license it from us, buy the rights from it, sell it. And Atari said no, HP said no, and that could have been the end of it, but they decided, let's do it on our own. So Steve Wozniak sold his HP calculator, Steve Jobs sold his Volkswagen minibus, and with the proceeds from those sales, they went ahead and founded Apple Computer. The first machine that Steve Woz created was the Apple One, seen here in a custom case, because it didn't come with a case, or a power supply, a display, a keyboard, pretty much nothing. It was just a circuit board, but it was really, really cool. Steve Jobs looked at it and said, okay, yeah, that does do a lot of stuff, but it's meant for hobbyists and for hackers. Consumers aren't going to buy it unless we make it look more attractive. We need to make it look like a utility, like an appliance. So Steve Woz updated it a little bit, and Steve Jobs put in a nice, sleek case, and 35 years ago this week, they shipped the very first Apple II. And it was on the Apple Computer Incorporated product line from 1977 to 1993, 16 years. And in that time, there were a lot of different models of Apple II. There was the Apple II original, the Apple II E, the Apple II C, C being for compact, because it actually had a handle, it was one of the first portable computers, and the Apple II GS, which was an especially cool model because unlike its 8-bit brethren, it was 16-bit. So although all the Apple IIs could run the same 8-bit software, this had its own operating system and 16-bit software that it could run exclusive to itself. Now these were not the first or only retro computers, or computers in the personal microcomputer revolution, of course. There were the Commodore, the Atari, the Amiga, the TRS-80, and they were all excellent machines. They all had strengths and weaknesses, well, except maybe the TRS-80. But what was it that made the Apple II unique? I mean, the Commodore 64 actually upsold the Apple II. There were more Commodore 64 users. But I'm not here to talk about C64. I'm here to talk about what made Apple II really cool and still makes it really cool. And perhaps most significantly was its expandability. It was far more expandable than its uh, contemporaries. And that's mostly because Steve Wozniak put these seven expansion slots in there, even though Steve Jobs didn't want him to. With these seven slots, that opened up a world of third party expansions where you could just plug a card in and change the functionality of Apple II. There were graphics cards, video cards, text cards, clock cards, interface cards, all sorts of different things that the Apple II was not designed to do, but could be made to do. And there are still new cards coming out for the Apple II, which I'll get to later. The hardware was very accessible. There were no screws. You didn't have to bring it to a genius bar. You just pop the lid off, and there were the expansion ports. So it was accessible not only via the hardware, but also the software. Well, as soon as you turn the Apple II on, if you don't have a disk in it, it immediately boots you to a basic prompt, and you can start programming. Now, I'm sure all of you here know how to program your machine, but if your typical consumer just turned on a Macintosh or a PC, they probably wouldn't know how to program their machine. They probably wouldn't know that they could program their machine. They would think that that would require uh, special purchases or installations or expansions or whatever. The Apple II made no secret that it wanted you to customize it. It wanted to be told what to do and how to do it. And it was as easy as just turning the machine on. It also had a lot of software that made it great in a lot of different sectors like accounting and business. VisiCal was the first electronic spreadsheet program. I think it was created right here at MIT in Boston. And it caught on like wildfire because now people didn't have to go back and erase all the numbers on their tech spreadsheets. And that led it on to additional productivity software like AppleWorks, which had word processing, spreadsheets, and database all in one program. Not three separate programs like Microsoft Office, but actually all one program. It was fantastic, very integrated. 
and of course it was huge in education because of games like Oregon Trail. And games may be what the Apple II was most fondly remembered for because there were a ton of franchises that began on the Apple II and are still around today, like Load Runner. There was a new version that just came out for the Xbox a couple of years ago. They're still making Load Runner games. Ultima, uh, Richard Garriott founded Origin Systems based on Akalabeth, which was an Apple II game, sometimes called Ultima Zero. And then he expanded it into this incredible line of role-playing games, massively multiplayer online games. Uh, now he's gone into space, Richard Garriott, based on the fortunes he made on Ultima. So this was all started on the Apple II before it got ported to everything else. Uh, Choplifter, another action game that was one of the very first games along with Loadrunner that made the transition from the computer to the arcade, as opposed to going the other way. And again, there was a brand new Choplifter that just came out this year for the Xbox. And there was King's Quest, which was part of the whole Sierra Online franchises. There was King's Quest, Police Quest, Space Quest, uh, Leisure Suit Larry, many of these now getting a reboot via Kickstarter. And since the Apple II was one of the more expensive machines out there, there were a lot of cracks and piracy happening in the Apple II scene perhaps more than other machines, because people want to play the games, but unlike the other machines, they couldn't afford the Apple II. So there was this huge scene of piracy, of BBSs, and there are, even to this day, entire online image galleries of these amazing crack screens. It was a work of art in and of itself. Chances are that if you found an Apple II disc image somewhere online, it probably has a crack screen on it that somebody modified to put their names that you know who it was who cracked it. But the good times were not to last for the Apple II. In 1984, after a compelling Super Bowl commercial, Apple released the Macintosh. And it was not immediately a success. In fact, the Apple II GS came out two years later, 1986, and it outsold the Macintosh. But slowly over time, Apple started shifting its resources and that support from the Apple II to the Macintosh until in 1992 they discontinued the 2GS and in 93 they discontinued the 2E. They tried to make the transition easier for people. There was an Apple IIe card that came up for the Macintosh that you could run your Apple II software on the Mac because without this card they were incompatible hardware and software architectures. But it, this came out in the 90s, it was too little, too late, and the Apple II pretty much died. Or did it? There are still people who use the Apple II, just like there are people here who are still hacking and cracking at old machines. And a lot of us get together well, every year in Kansas City in the middle of July, the middle of the Midwest, in the middle of the hottest part of the year, for Kansas Fest, which is the annual Apple II convention. Kansas Fest was started as Apple Fest in the late 1980s by a Kansas City-based software publishing company called Resource Central. After they hosted it for the first few years, they, like many other companies, started shifting support away from the Apple II. The attendees of the event decided to make it a volunteer-run event, and to keep the same number of syllables, they changed it from Apple Fest to Kansas Fest, even though the event is held in Missouri. Oh. Uh, we still have a lot of people who are very confused about that. We have the event start with a keynote speaker, and. This year's logo represents our speaker. The various uh, video game characters and sprites that you see in this logo are all from different games made by the same Apple II programmer. Does anybody recognize these characters? Probably not. Well, obviously, Crew does. He's registered for Kansas Fest. These games were all made by John Romero, co-founder of id Software, best known for Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake. He will be our keynote speaker this year. Other keynote speakers we've had include Mark Simonson, president of Beagle Brothers, or Beagle Bros, actually, often known for the floppy disks that came with signs that said, do not put in toaster, do not put in alligator, do not fly like a kite. Uh, Mike, uh, David Satella, who was the first editor-in-chief of Nibble Magazine back in the 80s. And back in uh, 2003, we actually had Steve Wozniak as our keynote speaker. This was before he was on Dancing with the Stars, so we were still able to get him back then. Once the keynote is held, then the real fun begins. We have an entire week. The event runs Tuesday through Sunday of activities, events, competitions. And the most notable competition we have is the Hackfest, 
while you are at Kansas Fest, and you have to be at Kansas Fest, you can program any Apple II you want, in any language you want, to do anything you want, and at the end of the week, whoever has the coolest program, not necessarily the most complete or most functional or most useful, but just the coolest, they win the Hackfest competition. We usually have about a half a dozen people who you hardly see at Kansas Fest. They just lock themselves in their rooms, and three days later, they show up with really cool stuff. Uh, this gentleman right here, two years ago, he cracked the original wizardry, cracked the copy protection, and in a way that had never been done before, he won Hackfest. Uh, last year, I believe the winner of what the winning entry was actually a demo written in a very small amount of code crew. Do you remember how big the demo was last year? 128 bytes. So that was last year's winning entry. Uh, that's the Hackfest. We also have gaming competitions. Uh, Dual Tris, which is a two-player Tetris. Uh, Shizen, or G Shizen right here. Uh, we have hardware workshops where you can put together your own expansion cards or Apple One replicas. And the people who sell the cards usually sell them as kits and they teach you how to solder everything and put it together and plug it in and make sure it works. We have a vendor fair where vendors come to buy, sell, trade hardware, software, and publications. And many people who have a lot of Apple II equipment and no room for it and just want to find a good home for it, just bring it and leave it out for the taking. Uh, as you can see with all the floppy disks right here. We often go to the Apple Store just to harass them because we are still Apple fans, even if they did ban the Apple II. We were actually thinking this year we might shoot a video of all of us bringing our Apple II's to the Genius Bar. <laughs> See how that goes over. And we play Bite the Bag, which has absolutely nothing to do with the Apple II, but it is a tradition. It's a party game where you have to pick up the bag with your teeth while you have only one point of contact with the floor. And uh, many have tried and many have fallen but it is nonetheless a fun tradition. But most of the daytime activities, nine to five, are sessions. We have people giving presentations about various areas of expertise. Uh, we have somebody else giving a presentation about Inform this year, because Text Adventures obviously have a strong Apple II heritage. We have presentations on uh, podcasting, programming and logo, hardware cleaning, hardware repair, a variety of different sessions. And if you can't actually make it to Kansas Fest, all those sessions are video recorded and put online on Vimeo, YouTube, archive.org, and on an iTunes video podcast. We have about two dozen videos every year, so about 48 videos in the last two years, which is when we started doing this. Uh, but this is only for people who can't make it to Kansas Fest. We hope people do come to Kansas Fest. It's about 40 to 50 people, so roughly the size of a, uh, a Boston-based demo party. Uh, and we teach you all the different things you can do with the Apple II. And there are many. Uh, uh, one thing you can do with Apple today is connect it to a modern machine, and such as Mac, PC, or Linux, and simply use it as a terminal. Uh, if you want to issue terminal commands, run Pine or Elm or Links or whatever, you can do that on your Apple II. There are other ways to use Apple II as a peripheral, as long as it's connected to your modern machine. You can run ADD Pro, which is Apple Disk Transfer Pro, just connect the cable from your Apple II to your other machine. And any floppy disk you put in your Apple II, you can zap over to the PC as a disk image. And I can't tell you how amazing this is for people who thought they may have lost access to their old floppy disks or don't have a way to back them up. I've had people come to me with floppy disks that 20 years ago they wrote their PhD on and they can't get at their dissertation anymore. They have the disks, but they don't have the hardware. And I put it on my Apple II, ADD Pro, five minutes later, give them a thumb drive, and they have it back. In the course of my day job here in Boston, I met the guy who wrote the desktop publishing program, Publish It, for the Apple II, and he still had all the source code, but no way to read it. So an hour later, I gave him a CD with all his source code on it, and he couldn't even wait until he got home. He was leaning over my shoulder, reading all his source code. He's like, oh yeah, I remember how I did that. That was amazing. <laughs> if you don't even have any software or operating system on your Apple II, with ADD Pro, it can zap everything over to your Apple II. You just turn it on, and it bootstraps it and sets it all up for you. So it's a great way to get an app until you just got off eBay or Craigslist up and running. Once you have those disk images, you can use them in an emulator. There are a bunch of ways to emulate the Apple II. This is called Virtual 2 that runs on the Mac. It's an 8-bit emulator, so it emulates the Apple IIe, I believe. There are 16-bit emulators for the Apple II GS. This is called Suite 16. It runs on Mac OS X. And of course, there are mobile emulators. One of the uh, most notable pro uh, creators of demos back in the 80s was the Free Tools Association, or FTA, a French programming group, and they are still around. 
they are now making a program called Active GS, which is an iOS app. You don't need to jailbreak your iPhone or iPod or iPad to install. This is available in the iTunes store, and it is an Apple II GS emulator. It comes loaded with all the demos they wrote, but it's actually very easy to swap in any disk image you want and run anything on your iOS device. But forget peripherals, forget emulations, let's use the actual Apple II. Here's an Apple crate. Some guy ripped out the guts from 16 Apple IIs and networked them all together into a parallel processing machine. <laughs> this is amazing. I mean, if one Apple II runs at one megahertz, then this is like 16 megahertz, oh my god. Holy shit. Indeed. <laughs> it's amazing. But you don't need to be quite that level of hardware hacker to enjoy an Apple II nowadays. There are expansion cards that are still coming out that you, with which you can expand your Apple II functionality. This is one of the newest ones, just came out last August. It's the A2 MP3 card. You plug it into your Apple II, and you plug in a thumb drive with MP3s, and you can play MP3s on your Apple II. It runs in the background, so you can continue using your Apple II for whatever other tasks you may have. And you can actually write software that interfaces with the card, so you, it's possible to actually have an Apple II game where you install the soundtrack to the game on a thumb drive and it plays MP3s. So it's an 8-bit game with an MP3 soundtrack. It just completely opens up the potential for sound on the Apple II. Uh, this gentleman wrote his own MP3 player. The card does come with MP3 player software. It's not quite iTunes. But this gentleman, Michael Kent, decided that that wasn't good enough for him because it was only 40 columns, so he came up with an 80 column version and a playlist functionality, and this was less than a month after the card came out. And I think it's actually written in a combination of basic and assembly. This is one of the most exciting cards to have come out lately. In fact, the first run sold out in about a week last August, and they just started taking orders for the second run yesterday. I ordered mine this morning. It's the CFFA 3000. There were two previous iterations of the CFFA, which stands for Compact Flash for Apple. And this accepts both Compact Flash and USB storage devices. You plug it in, and your storage device ideally has disk images on it that you created or that you downloaded. And you don't need to convert them back into a floppy disk like you would with ADT Pro. This actually emulates a floppy drive, and you can just swap in any one of those disk images and run it while it's still in a disk image format on an actual Apple II. Just as cool, if you, plug, if you insert an actual floppy disk or hard disk, you can convert it to a disk image right on the CFFA. So you don't need to connect it to another machine. It's a very fast way to convert a whole bunch of floppy disks and to throw them on one storage device without transferring it over a cable to another machine. The Ethernet card is an Ethernet card. They sell about 25 every three months, because that's about how often they do a run. And this allows your Apple II to go on to a broadband network, cable, DSL, T1, whatever. If you have an 8-bit Apple II, you can use the Contiki operating system. If you have an Apple II GS, you use a TCP IP stack that's available separately for free. And once your Apple II is online, which, by the way, is awesome, then there's a whole bunch of software you can use. There's a graphical user interface web browser which is just stunning. There is an SMS client, so you can't receive text, but you can send them. <coughs> this same programmer came out with a Twitter client, so you can send tweets from your Apple II. And I don't think, I, I think Twitter has since changed their API, so this program may not work anymore, but it used to, which is awesome, and it could probably work again. <laughs> and of course, there are still games coming out for the Apple II, because that's what everybody loves about the Apple II. This is called Silver and Castle by Jeff Fink, and he wrote this in response to the claim that a game like Wizardry never could have been written in AppleSoft Basic. It was just too slow a language, and he said, challenge accepted. So he wrote his own Wizardry client, or Wizardry clone, for the Apple II in AppleSoft Basic, and it runs really fast, and it's eight levels deep, and there are spells and equipment and characters. It's a lot of fun. Uh, there are still hacks and glitches going on. Glitch artist Melissa Barron took Oregon Trail and converted it all into lol speak. So it's like playing Oregon Trail with your cat. I, yeah. And, uh, and there are a bunch of online sources to get your Apple II fix and to be a part of the Apple II community. A2Central.com is updated frequently with news about the Apple II community, new hardware and software. Uh, 
mainstream coverage like the Apple one that was just sold this week at Sotheby's in New York for over $300,000. Oh my God, who has that kind of money? Uh, there are tons of hobbyist blogs. Hmm? <laughs> there are tons of hobbyist blogs, people talking about what they do with the Apple II. This is my site, made to look like an Apple II GS, update it once or twice a week with uh, whatever I'm working on that time. And uh, if you don't, if you were more interested in the history of the Apple II as opposed to the new stuff people are doing with it, uh, apple2history.org is a history of the Apple II that has been continuously being written in the last 21 years. This guy started writing this in 1991, I believe, and he never set it aside. Every time something new happens, he's been documenting it, going back, clarifying it. He's now currently working on adapting it to a book, actually, which he hopes to have published next year. But somebody actually beat him to it. For the first time in 10 years, there's a new book about the Apple II, and it's coming out tomorrow. This book is over 700 pages. It's the new Apple II user's guide, because there are just so many of them. And it details everything you need to do or know about the Apple II. If you just got one off eBay, this is everything you need to know about how it works, where to get stuff, how to set it up, how to run it. Uh, you can order it through Amazon.com. You can get it at Kansas Fest. A new Apple II book. Uh, magazines, there used to be a bunch of Apple II magazines like uh, Nibble and Insider, A+. A lot of them are being scanned and put online as free PDFs, very often with permission from the original copyright holder. Uh, there's a complete archive of Computist available at apple2scans.net uh, because he worked with the original publisher and got permission to scan it at high resolution. Now they're online. But there's also a new magazine that is still being published. This is the only remaining Apple II publication still in print. And it's not online, so it's really old school. It's exclusively hard copy. And it comes out every quarter. And uh, full disclosure, I'm the publisher. Uh, but since it's only quarterly, it's not really uh, current in the sense of fast-breaking news. So it's more about features, reviews, interviews. Uh, people who, like uh, Bob Bishop was the co-founder of Apple's R&D division along with Steve Wozniak. He also wrote the software that powered the TV show Tic Tac Doe because each of those nine squares was powered by one Apple II each. And we did an interview with him a couple of years ago. Uh, our cover story this time last year was all about text adventures, which some of you may have been interviewed for. And there's also podcasts if you prefer your news in the audio format. There are at least four podcasts that are relevant to the Apple II. Uh, the ones on the left, Open Apple and One Megahertz, are exclusively about the Apple II. Uh, Open Apple comes out every month. One Megahertz comes out 15 times in the last five years. So I don't know what schedule that might be. And uh, the Retro Computing Roundtable is every three weeks. Retro Bits is a regular, and they're more general about a variety of retro computers. There's also the Retro Mac Cast, which comes out every week. And that's primarily about Mac, but occasionally older apples as well. So whether it's podcast, magazines, books, hardware, software, uh, games, utilities, conventions, or whatever, the Apple II is surprisingly alive and well 19 years after it died. And uh, we hope that if you have any interest in the Apple II, you'll check out any of the sites that I mentioned, ask me any questions. And uh, I hope to see you at Kansas Fest someday. Any questions? Uh, you talked a bit uh, at the beginning of your uh, presentation about uh, uh, yeah, archives of uh, cracks or cracking zones for that. Is yes. there quite a specific archive which details the history of that scene? Or, uh, because I've been actually been Googling around for that quite a bit, and you find some bits and pieces here and there, but there's not, or I haven't found it uh, at least. Uh, there is maybe one site where you can see the whole history of that. So the question is, you're looking for more information about the history of the piracy and cracking yeah. scene on the Apple II? Especially the very early stuff. I know that Jason Scott has compiled on textfiles.com a gallery with about 420 screenshots of the crack screens, like the one I showed you. He doesn't actually have the crack software itself. He's also given some presentations, which I think are available on archive.org about the history of piracy on the Apple II. Um, as for where to actually get the software, I'm not entirely sure. But 
yeah, either textfiles.com or archive.org. I think Jason Scott has done a lot of work in both areas. Does that help? Uh, yeah. I know JuiceGS published a three-part series a couple of years ago about various uh, copyright protection methods, or DRM if you want to call it that today, for the Apple II and how to defeat each one. So different ways that software publishers protected their software uh, from a very technical perspective, like which bytes were modified, this and that. And he does give some examples in those articles, uh, but again, he doesn't identify a source for where to find those online. Uh, Computist, which is the magazine that is available online for free now, it's a PDF. It basically was founded with the intention of detailing how to crack software. So a lot of publishers didn't like that magazine, but they said, oh, this is so you can make your own personal backups, which is legal. And I'm sure that's exactly what people did it for. But even nowadays, if you come across some old Apple II software that you're trying to preserve, and you can't turn it into a disk image, or you can't copy it because it has that protection on it, Chances are that if you find an old copy of Computus, it'll tell you how to deprotect it and how to save it. That's the only way I was able to get Battle Chess installed on my hard drive, because it was originally only a floppy disk game. And so I pulled up an old issue of Computus, and they said, yeah, we, we defeated that crack 25 years ago. Here's how you do it. I'm like, great, thanks. Any other questions? So I'm not sure if this is a totally your question to ask, but I've been trying to make um, an Apple II emulator. I tried Sweet 16, I also tried another one, the name of which is escaping me right now. Um, it was not Sweet 16. But the problem was, I don't have my 2GS anymore. And I had to hunt around to find it wrong. And then I lost that ROM. Mm -hmm. But it was my understanding that it might not be legal to try to get a hold of ROMs and that maybe you have to go get a hold of the machine. I mean, I really just want it to run Paperworks Plus. That's all I want. I just want to run Paperworks Plus. So the question is, where do you find an Apple II ROM? Basically, yes. Oh, and HyperCard. HyperCard, yes. I mean, Hyper Studio. Sorry, I just uh, Technically, you are correct. Emulation is supposed to be done by individuals who own the original hardware. Yeah. Uh, because there is firmware in there and you need to buy the license to use the firmware, which means owning the hardware. And I had it, but my mom gave it away. <laughs> so you need to hunt that person down and get it back. Mm -hmm. um, there is a program for the Apple II GS called GS ROM Grabber. You just run that program and it grabs the ROM off that Apple II GS, which again requires you have an Apple II GS. Uh, most emulator developers that I know of do not provide the ROM. In fact, the documentation for Sweet 16 says, if you email me asking for the ROM, I will delete your email without replying. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that ROMs aren't out there. And I'm not dodging the question. I honestly don't know where to find the ROM because I've never needed to because I have my Apple IIgs just sitting on my desk at work. The last time I tried to do this, uh, I looked at the documentation, looked at the site, and it said, the ROM, then I put the ROM name, you know, 2 ps who got ROM, and I like Google it the file name, and there was a big catalyst. Ooh, okay. Yeah, so intelligent use of Google will likely find you what you need. Yeah. I did do that, but I didn't know what file name to look for, so I'll have to double check again. The other question is about how much would a 2 ps run you on eBay at this point-ish? <coughs> Apple II hardware prices have fluctuated a great deal in the past few years, and I attribute that to three reasons. One is the passing of Steve Jobs has brought all this stuff into vogue. Uh, second of all, people who grew up with the Apple II are now old enough that they can afford to recapture their childhood, so there's a certain nostalgia factor there. And third of all, I think it's becoming hipper to um, reinvestigate what the Apple II was capable of, even if you didn't grow up with it. So a younger crowd, just like the older crowd is getting into it for nostalgia, the younger crowd is getting into it because it's new to them. For the first 10 years I was going to Kansas Fest, I was probably the youngest unchaperoned attendee. And now there's like a dozen people there who are younger than me because they have the faintest memory of growing up with it or they discovered it when they were in college. And they think, oh my god, this is so cool. I can't believe things used to be this challenging. 
You can't just throw four gigs of RAM at it and make it do whatever you want. You have to work within limitations, which requires me to be creative. I love it. And so there are all different segments now of people who want to get an Apple II. As for how much it's going to cost you on eBay, I've seen them going, an Apple II GS, for example, uh, anywhere from $200 to $800, depending on what comes in it. Uh, some people sell it with a huge stack of software, and they identify every hardware card in it, and they test it to make sure it works. Some people say, I haven't turned this on in five years. There's a couple of keys missing. There's an expansion card in it. I don't know what it does. It's yours for 50 bucks. Yeah. You'll probably get cheaper deals on Craigslist. I think the average on Craigslist is around 100 bucks. But of course, on eBay, you have a certain amount of you know, buyer protection. Um, but yeah, it does definitely vary. I would not, I personally would not spend more than say 200 bucks on an Apple II GS, and maybe 150 on an Apple II. The last time I bought an Apple II GS, it was through a uh, vintage computer forum message board, and I spent 50 bucks on it. Yeah, I have two E. It's just I didn't I I didn't grow up using two E. I grew up using two GS, and I it can do things that yeah, <laughs> especially with two E. I have thanks. Yeah. Plus, you see the questions. No, no, that, that's very relevant. Um, the Open Apple Podcast, which I co-host, we talk about re, uh, current eBay listings every single week, and most of them are listings of the sort that I can't believe anybody would pay that. This is ridiculous. And unfortunately, that's most of the auctions that we find on eBay nowadays. Uh, if you go to Kansas Fest, there are people there with Apple IIs just being given away. Um, of course, if you want something like an Apple III or an Apple Lisa, those are going to cost even more. But they are not appearing in this film. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much.